All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a very uh, special pleasure and also honor to be here to be the presenter to introduce um, Professor C.L. Lu being the um, recipient of the 2011 Field Kaufman Award. Um, it's not an easy task, as <laughs> Andrea just said. There are at least two major challenges uh, to do this presentation. Uh, the first one is about me being the presenter. And uh, the moment I got an invitation, I went to see the website to see who are the previous presenters. Uh, I, sh I show you the list of the winners and then the presenters of the last 10 years. You can see this list includes uh, renowned professors, uh, industry leaders. In fact, many of them are previous uh, Phil Kaufman Award recipients, right? So it's definitely not the easy job to match the high standard set up by the previous uh, presenters. Uh, plus, as most of you know, um, Dave was my PhD advisor. Although I've been faculty member for over 20 years, there's always that pressure that they're giving a presentation in front of your PhD advisor. <laughs> and in this case, talking about your PhD advisor. Right? Uh, moreover, uh, Dave is such a great speaker, which all of you will witness uh, in person in a few minutes. Uh, he set up such a high standard, he's always, uh, always afraid not be able to meet that standard. And he also gave us a, a lot of advice and the tips about how to give presentations. In fact, one of the tips is that you got to tell a joke at the beginning of every talk. So I better get that out of the way, otherwise we'll be fading on slides number one. <laughs> and since it's the night honoring Dave, uh, so I got his permission to recycle a few jokes from Dave. <laughs> so here's one that goes that uh, this bird lover uh, he recently visited Los Angeles and went to Berkeley Hill into a pet store. His eye was immediately drawn on three birds that, uh, in the store. He went to the owner. He says, oh, can you tell me the price of these three birds? Uh, the owner looked at him and says, oh, you have very good taste, but these are very, very expensive birds. Uh, he said, really, how, how expensive? He said, this expensive one is the yellow one. It's $50,000. He said, you must be out of your mind. How can any bird cost $50,000? He said, yeah, 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 but this one can read New York Times for you. How many birds can do that? He said, oh, that's special. And he said, what about the, the bluebird? He said, the bluebird is $100,000. He said, no kidding. Tell me what it can do. He said, the bluebird can read Chinese novels for you. You know, Chinese is a lot more harder than <laughs> the, the English, right? He said, okay, that's fine. That, uh, he said, what about the red one? He said, oh, if you think the other two are expensive, don't even ask the price. He said, no, I can't afford. Just tell me. And he said, the red one's a quarter million dollars. <laughs> he said, that's outrageous to tell me that, that what, can, what can this red bird do? The owner looked at him for a while. He says, to be honest, I really do not know. But the, the other two birds call him professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with that encouragement, I also become a professor. <laughs> um, so the challenge number two is about uh, Dave. Uh, in fact, Rob and I had the pleasure to put together the nomination material. We started with the nomination by asking a very simple question. How many EDA pioneers you know uh, who is on the board of a major semiconductor foundry, is also on the board of several major fabulous semiconductor companies, right? is also a president of a prominent international research university, has also been a PhD advisor of a Turing Award winner, and also has his radio talk show. <laughs> uh, we believe the answer is exactly one, that's Dave. Uh, so how can one present the, the distinguished career of such a multifaceted individual in 30 minutes, right? In fact, I even do not know where to start. But then I remember an old saying, says, dance with the one. That who bought you, right? So uh, with that, uh, I think it's natural for me to start with the Dave's contribution uh, to EDA. Uh, as Riley said, we can summarize Dave's contribution to EDA in one sentence, that is transforming the ad hoc EDA to algorithmic EDA. Uh, Dave's first paper was in uh, 1982, uh, back in Las Vegas. Uh, the topic was on optimal bipartite folding uh, of PLAs. It's definitely an interesting topic, and Las Vegas is an interesting, exciting city. But what I want to say is the, the time. It's an absolutely exciting time for IC industry and also EDA. Here's the, uh, the, the backdrop that the IC industry in 1981, the one year before the paper was published. 
Uh, IBM just introduced its first PC, started the PC revolution, run up 4.7 megahertz uh, Intel processor, right? And using Microsoft DOS system. Uh, also the same year, Apollo introduced the first workstation and it offers the more computing power compared to some of the mini computers. And it also uh, supports very well uh, compute intensive graphics operations, which is crucial for EDA. Um, so we can kind of uh, characterize the de design complexity at that time uh, by the complexity of the processors uh, powered the first IBM PC, which is Intel 8088. It has a 16-bit uh, internal bus, 8-bit uh, external bus, with a transistor count slightly less than 30,000. So we are right at the, uh, this point, if I can use my pointer, um, at the early stage with this long exponential growth. Uh, for the uh, EDA industry back in 1981, that uh, uh, the physical design is actually the main theme, right? If you look at the techniques used in the physical design, it's quite ad hoc, right? Circuit partitioning, people use uh, uh, recursive refinement. A lot of time, just a pairwise change to see whether we can get improvement or not. Circuit placement based on greedy placement, a mean cut based placement, uh, PCB routing mainly based on line search plus maze routing, right? And IC routing primarily is uh, channel routing. And uh, what Dave has brought to the EDA is a great deal of uh, combinatorial, uh, combinatorial optimization techniques and, ex and experience uh, with rigor, elegance, and uh, much better efficiency. So let me give you a few examples. A classical work from Dave's group is on this uh, automatic floor plan design where you are given the number of blocks, you want to pack them in a very compact way, and also you want to minimize the total amount of interconnections among them. It looks an awfully hard problem. The reason is that you can shift the blocks left, right, up, and down, and there seems to be infinite number of positions, right? And how could you even search? Uh, they come up with a very elegant method. What they did is that they look at a special class of a floor plan called a slicing floor plan, where you are able to um, where you are able to run your, um, you can you're able to recursively decompose your floor plan, for example, by the lines cutting through the floor plan. In this case, you have one line goes this way, and then you have another line to decompose the left part, another line to decompose the right part. So basically, you can get a slicing tree out of that. Once you have the slicing tree where each uh, intermediate node representing either a vertical cut or horizontal cut, and all the leaf nodes representing the, uh, the modules you have, then you can encode this uh, slicing tree, use so-called the Polish expression, it becomes a string. Now once you have a string, it's a finite object that you can search. You can permute the sequence, the ordering of these strings to search through the entire solution space. You can change the order, you can invert the string, and so on and so forth. Let me show you a quick video of this. Uh, the search technique they used was called the similar needing. At that time, it was a very it was a new and a, but a, a very promising that the combinatorial optimization techniques. Not only they applied it to the floor plan, they actually wrote a whole book applying it to various stages of physical designs. Um, some of you may remember um, this panel uh, had the, at this very conference 24 years ago about the, whether similar needing was practical. They was a participant of that, and here is a third from the left. Uh, the first one is Jerry Sukup, the second one is Alberto San Giovanni, and the one at the very end is uh, Jonathan Allen from MIT. Uh, he has passed away, unfortunately, and he was the moderator for the panel. Um, so there's actually many other examples that Dave's uh, contribution to algorithmic innovations to EDA. Let me give you uh, some of them. For example, in his work on over-the-cell routing, uh, he used the formulation of finding a maximum independent set of a graph, special class of graph called a circular graph, which can be solved optimally, right? In his work on this new performance-driven uh, placement, uh, he used the uh, convex programming techniques to find the slack allocations in placement. 
Uh, in this work on scheduling that uh, he can show, you can do an a elegant transformation that uh, from a conditional sharing to an unconditional sharing. And uh, there's also this optimal that the uh, uh, clock period mapping that the NIPGAs that the world introduced the novel concept, the sequential arrival time. So you can see that uh, the breadth of Dave's work that uh, covers the entire implementation flow from routing to placement to logic synthesis to behavior synthesis. And uh, very few people is able to do that. Um, so here are the comments of some experts that uh, uh, Paul Wang, that uh, uh, sitting here with us, that the founder of EDAC, Novas, uh, Pi, and also uh, Phil Kaufman Award win, uh, winner of 2000, uh, 2000. He says, uh, Dave, together with his students, has successfully and uh, convincingly demonstrated the power and the elegance of algorithmic EDA uh, in the last 25 years. The impact of his work, uh, their work is enormous. Uh, we uh, used his teaching and the guidance uh, for the product development especially in floor plan placement route and uh, also uh, partitions. Also, there's a quote with, uh, uh, from Ajoy Bose. Ajoy is also with us here today, uh, president and CEO of Trenta. He said, as a uh, case of a point, that the uh, Trenta's architecture level floor planning tool called the Spike Glass Physical, uh, heavily used Dave's work uh, published in DAC 86. Finally, um, Chief Fu Chan, the president uh, and the COO of Synopsis, Chief Fu is also at this table. Uh, it says the leading products such as Astro and IC compiler directly benefits from uh, Professor Liu's research result and the inside uh, automatic floor planning placement and routing. Mm. I'm sure all of this uh, fully justifies a Kaufman award. However, if I simply stop here, I'll be uh, far from giving due recognition of Dave's contribution. Uh, in fact, a mistake like this has been made in the past. And since this is a, a Nobel Prize in EDA, let me tell you one mistake made in that uh, 90 years ago about the Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, that year's winner was Albert Einstein. Obviously, the, the, uh, Einstein's totally deserving for this award. But you look at the award citation, what it says is that for his service, to the theoretical physics, and especially for the discovery of the laws of a photoelectrical effect, which is obviously a big deal because that leads to the establishment of quantum theory. However, what they left out was this monumental contribution uh, of Einstein uh, to the theory, uh, to the general relativity, right, which was uh, formally introduced uh, at the 1915 and uh, confirmed in 1919 through this uh, experiment with the solar eclipse. Uh, I don't want to be the one repeating the same mistake, so let me say, <laughs> going back to look at the entire career of Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes through three stages, and uh, MIT, uh, UIUC, and the National Tsinghua University. So let me start with the MIT era. Dave started as a graduate student at MIT. He's, uh, Master thesis was actually on a totally different topics. Uh, the title here is a study in machine aided learning. Right? Remember, this is way before internet. This is way before any of the Rosetta Stone software was known. Right? Uh, if you read this abstract, it was very interesting. They was investigating method to use computers to teach you arithmetic and the matrix multiplications. Unfortunately to EDA, that, that Dave did not continue this line of research. <laughs> uh, for an interesting reason, he was uh, promised to do this on the time-sharing operating systems, which uh, took much longer than anticipated. Dave ran out of patience. He moved on to do something else. Um, his PhD thesis topic is a lot closer to EDA. Now, the title is Some Memory Aspect uh, of Finite Automata. Okay, we all use finite state machines. Um, his advisor is uh, Dean Arden, and he has been at MIT for about uh, eight years. Uh, was involved in an early computer project called the Win, uh, Whirlwind, uh, with uh, one, one of the early computers. I want to give you uh, uh, sort of one piece of the data is that uh, Arden, in fact, is also the PhD advisor of uh, Jack Dennis, some of you may know. And uh, Jack was the PhD advisor of Randy Bryan, who got the uh, Kaufman Award two years ago, so there's also that connection. But uh, when we talk about the Arden, I also want to sidetrack to tell you a story. And uh, Dave actually hosted the Arden's visit at Illinois 
20 years later after he got the PhD degree in 1992. And I want to tell you how they made the introduction. So first, they that, uh, made the introduction of his students to the, the Arden, and this is what he said. I'm glad uh, I have better students than you. <laughs> and then he turned around, he introduced Arden uh, to his students, and he said, I feel blessed that I have a better advisor than all of you. Right? <laughs> By the way, this is uh, so typical of Dave. Witty, uh, full of sense of humor, and also extremely modest. He always shines a spotlight to someone else, his colleagues, his students, in this case, also his former advisor. Uh, after the PhD study at MIT, he continued to be a faculty member there. Um, in 1968, uh, there are two influential books uh, in computer science came out. and I will say one of them is uh, The Art of Computer Programming by uh, down, uh, down at the Canoes, which is not far from here for, uh, at Stanford University. The second book is really Introduction uh, to Combinatorial Mathematics by Dave. The reason I said it's a landmark contribution to computer science is that if you look at the the sample chapters, right, on recursive relations. It's on fundamental concept, the theory of graphs, on trees, circuits, and cut sets, transport networks, matching theory, linear programming, and dynamic programming. All these concepts are very important in computer science, especially important in EDAs, right? Uh, Remember also the timing. This is way before, several years before, actually, the concept of NP completeness was even being introduced. That was Cook's work in 1971. They was also in, involved in an interesting project called the Project Mac. Uh, by the way, this has nothing to do with Steve Jobs or Apple computers, right? <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, when this project's being formed in 1963, I believe Steve Jobs was still uh, element in elementary schools. Right? Uh, it stands for a project on mathematics and the computation launched at MIT. Later on, this will also be renamed and to be as a multi multiple access computers or machine-aided cognition, or man and the computers. It has a very strong AI group. You can see this giants from AI field, Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy being part of that. There's also a very strong system component uh, led by Carbato. Uh, the effort was to develop uh, a successor of the first time-sharing uh, system called the Maltics. Uh, it's a very famous system. In fact, it produced the multiple Turing Award winners out of that project. There was a feature article in Scientific America uh, back in 1966. Uh, again, this is a pre-internet days, right? At that time, they have over 100 TTY terminals connecting various, uh, connect to the computers uh, on campus and uh, also to some private homes outside of the campus. Dave's work uh, there was on combinatorial mathematics, graph theory, uh, optimization algorithm, even including table-driven compiler systems. But through the, the involvement in this project, they was also very interested in real-time operating systems. So that led to the, another landmark result that was called the uh, uh, scheduling algorithms for multi-programming in real hard, uh, uh, hard real-time environment. It's a classical work. Let me try to explain to you in a rather modern setting. Some of me, you may know that actually there's several cars driving in San Francisco all by itself and provided by Google. Um, it has various kind of sensors. It has a video camera at the front, and uh, let's say, uh, let's assume it goes 30, 30 frames per second. It has uh, some uh, rotational sensors on the top looking at the 3D map, forming the 3D map, uh, looking at the environment. Moreover, it also has the sensors, radar sensors at the front and also the side. Um, I'm just making up, but let's assume it's uh, 40 samples right, per second. So naturally, you have an on-chip computer to process all these signals, and uh, how would you schedule them? Which one should go first? Right? So Dave's result shows that uh, if you decide to go with static scheduling, which means you decide to order a priori and you never change that, what you do is that you go with radar sensor first, video camera second, and rotating sensor third. The reason is that uh, you go with a decreasing of the sampling rate. And he further shows if you do this, you are guaranteed to have a, a utilization result at least 78%. And this is also called rate monotonic scheduling because uh, you go with a decreasing of the rate, right, the sampling rate. However, you can do better. If you decided to do a dynamic scheduling, which you can change the order in a dynamic way, um, what, the best way to do that is you look at the, which one is going to expire 
so be overwritten, and you service that job first. So that way, it's called the deadline-driven scheduling can guarantee you can have a full utilization. Um, this com comparison of different deadlines can be very costly, so in practice, you want to do uh, a hybrid uh, scheduling where, for example, you let a reader go first, always uh, being the first one, and then between the, the video and the, the rotation sensor, you use deadline to, dri to drive that. Uh, this is a classical work I mentioned in the previous slides. has over 7,000 citations. To give you a sense about number, uh, 7,000. When I started assistant professor at UCLA, uh, one senior professor told me at that time saying that if you have a paper, over 100 citations can be called a citation classic. Obviously, this, the, the bar has been a lot higher these days, but still very few papers get over 1,000 citations. Uh, to my knowledge, there's only a second EDA papers get into the 7,000 club. Uh, that is Randy Brand's paper on binary decision diagrams. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the comments from Nani Dimakali, an expert in exp uh, the, the embedded system. He says, the impact of his work on embedded system design is huge, uh, as most systems do use Dave's algorithm, uh, or some, it's, uh, some of its uh, variations. Many products, from telephones to vehicular robotic controllers, embed rate monitoring schedule in their operating system uh, or system software, which is very true. Um, also, um, around that time, Dave decided to make a move um, to Illinois together with uh, Professor Chen Lu and his wife, which we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, at Illinois, he published another landmark book in computer science uh, called The Elements of Discrete Mathematics. Um, so the topics covered in this book, including sets and the propositions, uh, relations and the functions, graphs and the trees, recursive relation and generating functions, groups and the rings, and also Boolean algebra. Um, this now becomes a standard curriculum in any undergraduate computer science program worldwide. Uh, in fact, the book has been translated into many different languages. Uh, I want to point out the Chinese translation is 1981. That also happened to be the year I get into college. So my second year textbook was Dave's book that made me decide to come to Illinois to study with Dave. Uh, uh, at Illinois, this is also the time Dave had graduated many PhD students during his 26-year uh, tenure at Illinois. I hope I have a complete list of this. Uh, uh, you never know that uh, <laughs> there might be some names being left out. Uh, many of them are that uh, distinguish the faculty members. For example, Andy Yao, uh, he's currently uh, at Tsinghua University. He was also with Stanford, Princeton. Um, he's the winner of the 2000 uh, Turing, uh, ACM Turing Award. Uh, Han Huai Liang at the National uh, University of Singapore. Uh, Prim Vaidya uh, was a faculty member at Illinois. Uh, Martin Wang sitting here with us is uh, with UC Austin and now with Illinois. Uh, myself, I've uh, been UCLA since 1990. Uh, Taiwan Kim and uh, Seoul National University, and also Ryan Lipskin Hadas at uh, Harvard Med, being the, also the current department chair. Of course, many of them also went to industry and, uh, in fact, uh, being successful leaders. Um, so myself has stopped in both roles, uh, founded uh, um, Andrea mentioned in A Plus, acquired by Magma, and also. Uh, Auto ESL acquired by Xilinx. Uh, Pei Chen was uh, uh, my uh, sort of a collaborator running the engineering operations in both companies. And uh, we also have Tong Gao uh, sitting here at the, on that table, that the uh, fellow at the Synopsis. And Amor Master is the CTO, co founder of Calypto, now has a, a very strategic relationship with Mentor Graphics. And uh, Uni, and sitting on that table, and the founder and the CEO and, uh, of a primary. Uh, global research. Uh, so Dave's algorithmic training had a profound impact to his students. I can speak firsthand. I mean, uh, among these two companies we have, uh, certainly we have some nice GUIs, some interesting database, but really what set us apart from the competition is the algorithmic innovation. So in, any, in both cases, we apply very sophisticated combinatorial optimization techniques. That made the difference. Uh, here are some of the photos Dave with his student. Uh, every student loved Dave. So here is uh, a T-shirt we made for Dave uh, back in 1987. I'm not sure you can read the words on that. It says the best boss on earth, uh, which is absolutely true. 
uh, not only uh, we are a fan of Dave, uh, now our students also become a fan of Dave. This is a photo taken in 1989 DAC, and uh, that time I haven't graduated, but Martin has. So you can see in the photo there's a number of students, uh, which were Martin students, also join us in this uh, family event. Um, at Illinois, this is also where Dave's uh, research contribution get a lot of recognition. So let me start with the 1986 IEEE Fellow, 1987 Guggenheim Fo uh, Foundation Fellowship, 1990 ACM Carl Trumpstrong Outstanding Education Award, and then uh, IEEE uh, Taylor Booth Education Award, uh, IEEE Education Medal, ACM Fellow the very first year, and also Technical Achievement Award from uh, IEEE Circuit System Society, uh, ACM uh, CDA Distinguished Service Award. Again, uh, Technical Achievement Award, but from a different committee from uh, IEEE Real-Time Systems Committee. I believe this day is very few actually got uh, this award from both committees. Uh, continue IEEE Millennium Medal and uh, uh, IEEE Circuit System Society Golden Jubilee Medal. Um, by the way, I have to delete some of them to make sure all this fits on one slide. <laughs> uh, so uh, his research program at Illinois made him a world-class leader in EDA as well as a, uh, a leader in computer science. Um, but they didn't stop here. That uh, after successful leading uh, group that uh, with uh, six or seven PhD students, at least that's the size I remember when I was working with Dave, Dave decided to make a huge transition, going leading an institution over 6,000 students. Um, so um, in 1998, they become the president of the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. So first, Dave's move to uh, Taiwan, it's a true blessing to the EDA community um, that in Taiwan, here I'm quoting some of the statistics from uh, Chi Feng's uh, endorsement letter. Uh, Dave was instrumental in setting up some funding programs and also special faculty position program in EDA since 2000. Uh, this great, made a great impact to Taiwan, really put the Taiwan EDA on the map. As one point of example, that the, if you go back to look at the 2009 uh, DAC proceedings, you count the number of papers. Uh, the number one is from US, obviously, it was 80 papers. The number two is actually from Taiwan with 15 papers. That's almost 20% of the US. Just as a reference point, Taiwan's GDP is less than 3%. And it's very impressive. It's ahead of uh, much bigger players like uh, Canada, China, Germany. So it's a true accomplishment. Um, another example, uh, ISPD contest. ISPD stands for National International Symposium of Physical Design. So Taiwan is really doing very well. Third place uh, on placement contest, 19, uh, 2006. The first and the second the places on Global Routing 2008, and the first and the second uh, places on Clock Network Synthesis 2009. So everywhere you go, you'll see the name Taiwan in EDA. Uh, but of course, as the president, uh, Dave also made uh, monumental contributions to push National Tsinghua University to new highs. Uh, in 2000, he established a university venture capital and, uh, to help the facility technology transfer. He established this uh, College of Technology Management in 2000 with uh, 150 million uh, NT Taiwanese dollar donation from TSMC, and uh, construction of a new uh, library building started in 2001 uh, with a 300 million dollar uh, NT dollar donation from Macronix, and the total fundraising at the end of his uh, four-year tenure was over 700 million NT dollars. He grew the, uh, the student population from uh, a little bit over 4,000 to over 8,000. It's a, a great achievement. But what is also unique, this is something that I would say every campus leader uh, uh, strive to do, right? But what's unique about Dave is that he shows a great amount of care and the love uh, of his students. He participated uh, in many of these students' events. But there's also I want to share you with a very unusual story that within one month of uh, Dave's appointment uh, at the National Tsinghua University, there's a love triangle murder case. Uh, two girls, and all both in love with uh, one uh, male student, and the one girl went way out of the board, end up killing the other competitor. Uh, this is one month within Dave's appointment. Obviously, it's a very sad, tragic story. And also, you can imagine it's a media crisis, right, that uh, all the reporters now on campus to do that. Uh, so 
so first, Dave shows a great sympathy to the victim's family, and he visited them not only right after the incident happened, he visited them every year um, before the new year, that the four, four years during his tenure. What is even on Euro is that uh, Dave also visited the, uh, the student who committed the crime in the jail once it happened. Um, Dave felt that as a NTHU student, she deserved the attention and the care from the university. Even she uh, has made a tremendous mistake, right? Not only that, he also visited this girl at the end of the, for his four-year tenure, when the story is completely forgotten by almost everyone. And uh, his encouragement, with his encouragement, uh, uh, the student's doing very well in the jail now. He's actually starting with a new career being a translator, right? So it just, uh, he gave this person a new life. So now our former president says that uh, he has this slogan says, uh, leave no child behind, right? So to me, this is the best example, leaving no child behind as a uh, president, university president of a major research university. There's no need to say that the uh, students love Dave, that uh, uh, at the end of his tenure, they put up a, a, a program, the farewell party, all organized by themselves. And uh, these are the, some photos of that event. So for a, a person as colorful as this, uh, naturally you want to know more, right? And especially about his personal side, how he developed into a person like this. So let me share you some uh, information about that. Uh, uh, in his early years, and he started uh, with uh, a, a, a Choi Ko Middle School in Macau. Um, now it's known to be the second Las Vegas. In fact, it's bigger than Las Vegas now. Um, after st finish the high school, he moved to the National Chenggong University in Taiwan. In fact, at that time, it was even not called the National Chenggong University, it's called the Tainan College of Engineering. They was the very first graduate uh, from that the university, as, just as they switched the name. And then after that, uh, he took a long journey across Pacific, went to MIT, started his PhD degree, uh, which I have covered that part. Uh, at the Chengkong University, um, he also met an amazing lady at that time, as a, a beautiful young lady, that was Professor Jane Lu. Um, so this is the, uh, the relationship continues uh, because Jane also became a uh, PhD student at the MIT. So both of them got married in uh, 1960. These are the obviously precious old photos uh, back uh, uh, 50 years ago. Uh, so they had uh, uh, 50 plus years of a uh, uh, true love and the companionship. And the, both of them enjoy good food and experts are where and the, and to eat. And the, if you go to Taiwan Far East, make sure you visit either Dave and Jane, you will get a lot of good advice. Uh, both love to sing. Uh, the, uh, the knows many new popular uh, Chinese songs. In fact, I know Art is sitting somewhere. I forgot to ask Art to bring the guitar so that we'll have a <laughs> <laughs> entertainment here. Uh, not only that, they are also lifetime collaborators. Uh, as I said, both of them were professors at Illinois, so they had, uh, for example, a co-author book called The Linear System Analysis. They also have a, a number of joint papers. I mentioned the last paper on scheduling algorithm with conditional resource sharing. That was a paper uh, with um, uh, Jane. So in fact, uh, we get some free the, the inspirations from another researcher from a different field. Um, but I, I think I'm safe to say their best collaborative product is none of this is their wonderful daughter, Kathleen. Uh, she graduated from Harvard University in 1991. Uh, she is now the, the uh, assistant professor at the uh, uh, University of San Francisco in the field of a medical, uh, in the medical field. Um, Kathleen has two lovely uh, daughters, so now Dave is a grandpa, and uh, also here are some family photos, and uh, Dave with his uh, two brothers. So now Dave has stepped down as a university professor. Being a grandpa, so you will naturally ask, what does Dave do in his retirement? So I also asked that question a few years ago. Guess what answer I got? He said, I'm a 70-year-old man leaving two lives of a 35 years old. <laughs> Which is absolutely true that uh, first, he is a, a very popular invited speaker everywhere that, uh, and uh, universities, major conferences, uh, that, uh, uh, industry forums. Um, some of you may remember that uh, he had uh, a very 
uh, exciting that the, the interesting talk uh, as a keynote speaker for the uh, ASP DAC 2009. If you don't know, send me an email, I'll send you the video links to that. And also, he's a highly respected, highly sought board members and advisors. He was a, a, a member of the board uh, with uh, UMC, uh, one major silicon foundry. He's on board of uh, a, a number of large fiber semiconductors, including uh, MediaTek, Macronix, Powerchip. I'm sure a lot of EDA companies here are dying to do business with them. And uh, a number of uh, board of uh, a number of small companies. And uh, in fact, I think I leave out some of them here as well. Also, more recognitions. And here are two photos that uh, they've received an honorary PhD degree uh, from Taiwan uh, Chengchung University, 2011, an honorary doctor um, uh, degree from uh, University of Macau in 2004. Uh, Dave continues to publish that uh, these are Dave's books. <laughs> <laughs> But it, uh, very different subjects. They cover a wide range of topics, from uh, natural science to social science to his personal experiences, uh, reflections on love, f uh, family, value, education, and so on and so forth. Uh, I strongly encourage you to read it. Uh, you probably have to learn the Chinese first before you can read it, but it's well worth it. Right? Uh, what is more amazing, I think, uh, to many of us is uh, that Dave started his uh, radio talk show uh, about seven years ago. Um, you can go online to listen to that. It's every Wednesday, uh, 8.15 to 8.45, and rebroadcast re at 6.30 to 7 p.m. That, that All in Taipei time, you can go to this uh, website called the IC975. Uh, um, I, give the in, uh, I give the Chinese title here, and some of them ask me to, how to translate it. Uh, I, I have to consult Dave. He gave me one translation called, uh, Let Me Tattling Make You Laugh. That's the title of the program. So you may remember, you may sort of curious, what does Dave tattle about? I was also very curious. Fortunately, Dave gave me two of his CDs, so I listened to some of the, a sample of these programs. Uh, it's all in Chinese, so you have to uh, make some effort to enjoy that. But I can share you with some topics which are familiar to you, like the US audience. For example, he will talk about the start of Google, and a short story about the famous writers, such as The Old Man and the Sea by Hemingway, uh, Obama's inaugural speech a few years ago, and the Steve Jobs' commencement speech at Stanford, a very famous piece. Right? Um, I have to say, I haven't listened to too many of them other than these two on this set of CDs. But let me give you my perspective from a different angle. Uh, uh, Tim Chen sitting there. Tim and I uh, run an international center on system on chip funded by National Science Foundation and their counterpart in Taiwan and also in China. So since 2000, so we have been meeting once a year and uh, uh, sometimes twice a year. So um, we invited Dave as our keynote speech every year. So let me share you some of the, uh, by the way, the funding has ended. So now we started a new forum, basic continuation of that invitation only called the Pacific Rim Outlook Forum. Uh, for IC technologies, uh, in short, called the Profit Forum. Uh, so we have Dave as a keynote speech every year. So here are some of his titles. Uh, 2004, uh, there's Mathematics in Poetry, Poetry in Mathematics. Uh, 2005, To See the World in a Grand of a Sand. Uh, and uh, 2006, The Joys of Speech Making. You will witness that very soon. And also uh, 2006, again, representation of information theory, uh, of information, coding theory, and the cryptography. Uh, and 10 commencement on technical managers. What is a professor? Um, heaven and the literature. And uh, the 19th Design Automation Conference. And the trinity of discovery, invention, and the creativity from computing to EDA, this very recent ones. So I'm sure this list of the titles alone is a big traction for you to come to this forum. So if you ever get an invitation from me, just say yes to and come. <laughs> um, so it's getting a little bit late, so I'd like to uh, wrap up. But, uh, but it's not an easy task to wrap up for a person with so many dimensions, right? So for that, I emailed to some of the, uh, Dave's former students and asked for their opinions, their uh, deep impressions about Dave. I also made a trip to Silicon Valley to meet with some of them in person. So here's a photo that uh, uh, I'm going to show you. So I, I asked them, I said, uh, what's your sort of the, the, the deepest impression of Dave? 
uh, Ron talked to me about the Dave Strokes and the inspiration, and Hong Huai talked about Dave being a true educator. Um, uh, Andy Yao, during one winner, says that Dave is always on the positive side. He gave me one story. He says that he was working um, by himself on a very difficult mathematical problem. He finally solved it. He went to see Dave. He said, oh, I have this amazing result on this problem. To his disappointment, they put out a book that says, yeah, but this problem has been solved by someone else. <laughs> You're a little bit late. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, he was very disappointed. But they point out and say, but however, you have proven yourself, you can really solve some hard problems, which obviously turned out to be true. He went out, uh, I mean, being a, a, a great leader in theoretical computer science. Um, among this dinner table, I asked some of the people's uh, uh, patrons sitting here saying that, that Dave is so versatile, and uh, uh, every uh, topics in EDA he worked on and also covers social science, humanity, and uh, natural science. And uh, so uh, Richard Sun tell me and uh, think about his humor and humbleness is a, a big part of that. In fact, he was the one telling me the story about Arden's visit. Uh, Tong talk about his uh, Dave's patience and the stimulation of the students. Uh, Amor, uh, Amor talked about the uh, they were always looking at the big picture as being a storyteller. He told me the story that his very first paper, he gave it to Dave with excitement. And they marked it all in red and uh, gave it back to him. Plus, there's a comment that says, Armo, where is the story? <laughs> That's what Dave is always looking for. And uh, finally, that uh, uh, Uni talked about Dave being a real guru, uh, a thinking out of the box. So with that, he also told me uh, one story Dave told, which will be the, my last joke of the night and uh, from Dave. Uh, the three friends get together that after cocktail, that uh, somehow the topic get into about the uh, life and death. And they says, oh, what would you like to be remembered when you're lying in a coffin? Oh, one friend who's a doctor, he says, oh, we want people to say that a wonderful doctor was saving the life for so many other people. And the, the second one uh, was engineer. He says, oh, but I also want people to say I'm a very good husband, a loving father. And the third one was a professor. He looked at them, he says, oh, I want them to say, look, he started moving again. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking out of a box. <laughs> uh, you notice I didn't say anything because I was busy taking notes and uh, working on my computers. But when I put this presentation together, I really want to add a comment. I would think they're always seeking new challenges and a broader impact. From a mathematician uh, with pas uh, who's passionate about numbers and discrete structures, to an applied theoretician making fundamental contributions to EDA and real-time systems, and to a university president developing his knowledge, passion, and the love to advance the state of art of higher education, and then to a global citizen shuttling between US Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, and China, touching the hearts and the souls of millions through his voice over the airwaves. Uh, that is Dave. Dave never stops. Dave's always looking for deeper and uh, broader impact. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome 2011 recipient of the Phil Kaufman Award, Professor Dave C. L. Liu. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I am currently based in Taiwan. However, for 40 years, I grew up professionally in the United States, which is a majority part of my life. And I hope before too long, a majority part becoming a minority part. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a saying, that if you want to find out all the bad things you have done in the past, in particular, 
those bad things you haven't really done. Run for a public office. All the news reporters will find it out for you. <laughs> Allow me to paraphrase that. If you want to find out all the good things that have happened to you, in particular for those you don't really think you deserve, as a good friend to give a presentation on your behalf, he'll find out all of them for you. <laughs> so thank you so much, Jason. Thank you for... <clears throat> reminding me how grateful I should be for all the good people, including many of you who are here tonight, and all the good things, including this prestigious Kaufman Award. For that, I'm so fortunate to receive and to encounter. Indeed, I want to first of all thank EDAC and CETA for this extraordinary honor. When I look at the impact of electronic design automation on this multi-billion semiconductor industry, when I look at the thriving electronic design automation industry by itself, when I look at all the intellectual giants, all the industrial leaders, all the young and energetic minds in our profession, I am humbled. And I feel so fortunate that I could be a small blade of grass in this grand landscape. I started as an undergraduate in Taiwan. I took a class in power transmission and distribution, not knowing that 50 years later, smart grid becomes one of the most important topics. I took a class in battery, storage batteries, those monstrous bricks for automobiles and trucks, not knowing today, extending the life of a battery in an iPhone 4 is a very challenging topic. I took a class in electronics where my teacher told me the difference between a trial and a pento although I don't think that had anything to do with 3.5 material today. <laughs> when I was in graduate school in the first semester, I took a class in switching theory where I learned to use a kind of map to minimize the number of logic gates, which is about seven or 10 to be used in a logic circuit. Not knowing that today we have tens of millions of logic gate on a single chip. I took a class in circuit theory where I learned how to write down the frequency response of a filter in closed form mathematical expression. Simulation analysis of transistor circuit using a computer came only several years later. As Jason mentioned to you, in the early 60s, I studied graph theory, linear programming, dynamic programming, as interesting, beautiful, mathematical topics, not knowing that 15 years later, it was my entrance ticket to the wonderful land of design automation. The first design automation conference I went to was indeed 1982, where together with my student Jack Egan, we had a paper on PLA folding. Coincidentally, in the same proceeding, there was a paper on the same subject by Gary Hutchtel, Richard Newton, and Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli. So at that time, because placement and routing are mathematically well-defined topics, which in algorithmic flavor, a lot of theoretical computer scientists went into it. I was hooked, and I stayed. Indeed, motivated by leaders in the field, and jokingly urged by the dictum that if you can do 3% better than Berkeley, you will have a paper 
a deck or ICC ID. <laughs> and, but my students and I indeed had a wonderful time learning and doing research. We followed the path of a strong algorithmic approach to the solution of design automation problems. Indeed, even today, when you look at the solution of any computation problems, whether the figure of merit is speed, accuracy, or power consumption, you first look very hard at the device level. 22 nanometers is coming soon. Then you look very hard at the architecture level. Multi-core is here to stay, so I was told. Then you look very hard at the programming level. It goes all the way back to my dear friend David Cook's work on paraphrase compiler, and then to today's sophisticated multi-thread architecture. But all of these are for the implementation of algorithms. A good algorithms can cover a lot of the shortcomings. A bad algorithm ruins that all. So indeed, that is where we had a lot of fun and having really a good time. But research regenerates itself. One research paper lists another research paper. One research paper opens the door for a new research area. Education also regenerates itself. One student leads to another student. One student initiates his own generation or her own generation of students. So as Shakespeare once said in a famous line in one of his sonnets, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long live this and this give life to thee. I enjoy tremendously the duo of a researcher and a professor. At this point, I want to thank my good friend, Rob Wutenbach. I'm a professor of computer science emeritus at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So Rob is my boss emeritus. <laughs> <laughs> Rob is the chief nominator for this Kaufman Award but also several days, Rob gave me and Jane an award as, an, as a distinguished educator. And indeed, thank you so much, Rob. As Jason mentioned, my thesis advisor was Professor Dean Arden. I always remember Dean. He taught me the true meaning of a scholar and a gentleman. And I won indeed to live up to what he has set out as a role model for me. And then, of course, I want to thank all my students. They taught me things I did not know. They tolerated me for my stubbornness and rigidity. They allowed me to share the young, energetic mind and hopes. And most important of all, at least for this evening, they won the Kaufman Award for me. It is indeed for their work, for their contribution, for their impact that I think the selection committee was impressed. So in my student and their students and their students, I see present and future leaders in our profession. Uh, 13 years ago, I took up a position as the president of the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan the academic administrative responsibility not only gave me further insight into the mission of education, a deeper meaning of what an educator should be, but it also indeed gives me the opportunity to serve on a number of high-tech companies' board of directors that include semiconductor foundries, memories, uh, telecommunications uh, and design service. 30 years ago, when I was a graduate student, we talked about a transistor will cost 30 US dollars. Today, in a board meeting, we talk about what happens if the price 
of a one gigabyte DRAM falls below a dollar US. But indeed, I enjoyed the opportunity to learn from the industrial experience and bring that back to the educational environment. As Jason mentioned to you, seven years ago, besides my academic and industrial activity, I started a radio show. There was a saying that a professor is someone who has been trained to speak exactly for 15 minutes on any subject with no preparation. <laughs> uh, I am halfway there. <laughs> my radio show is exactly 22 minutes. My producer will not let me run over time for 30 seconds. I talk on a number of random subjects, but it takes me two or three days to prepare for a 20 minute show. But indeed, I enjoy the opportunity of being a professor and being a student again. I feel I am still foolish and I'm still hungry. Mm. Mm. Jing and I went to school together as undergraduates uh, at Qingkong University and then at MIT. Then we taught together uh, at the University of Illinois, of Illinois Urbana-Champaign for 20 some years. Not too long ago, a friend who doesn't know Jing well talked to me and said, you have been running around, giving lectures, attending meetings, socializing, and traveling. Don't you have any problem if you don't spend a lot of time with your wife? I said, Jane is a full-time research fellow at Academia Sidica. She also has six or seven students from the Tsinghua University every year. She works six days a week from nine to eight, on the seventh day, she takes care of household chores, so I don't need to spend any time to take care of her. <laughs> this friend of mine said, when did you find a young wife like that? <laughs> so indeed, thank you, Jane, my forever young first lady. <laughs> But alas, I remember in adversity as well as in joyous moments like this evening, what the famous baseball player Lou Gehrig said when he bid farewell to his friends in the Yankee Stadium. He said, today, I feel I am the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Allow me to thank all of you for giving me all my luck in my life. Thank you. Thank you.